Hello and welcome back. The topic of this lecture is our third and final family of views of well-being. Uh, and these, uh, this family of views goes by the name uh, the objective list view or sometimes just the list view. So uh, the first uh, step in understanding an objective list view is to uh, check right in uh, at the beginning of uh, Brad Hooker's piece on well-being. And uh, he draws a distinction that's going to be uh, end up being pretty important uh, to well-being generally, uh, and one that we haven't really taken a look at yet. And that is the distinction between an instrumental and an intrinsic or non-instrumental good. And so there's two ways that something can be valuable, or two ways that something can be good. Uh, one is that it can be good instrumentally. The other is that it can be good, as Hooker says, non-instrumentally. The more common term for that is intrinsically, right? Um, so uh, something is instrumentally good if it is good for the sake of something else, right? The reason it's good is because it allows or gets you something else or uh, comes with something else or something like that. Uh, something is intrinsically good when it is good in and of itself. Right? That's, that's a, 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 an easy definition, but that doesn't necessarily clarify the concept very much. And so let's take a look at a few examples. Um, so let's start with the king of all instrumental goods, uh, and that is money. Okay, money is valuable, no question, right? Uh, I don't want you to get the impression that the distinction between instrumental goods and intrinsic goods is such that intrinsic goods are like really good, but instrumental goods are not really good. No, 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 they're all good, okay? They're just two different ways of being good. Um, so money is definitely valuable or good. It's just that it's not valuable in and of itself, Okay. Uh, the the so so consider uh, if you uh, you know I imagine you've got a couple of bucks on you somewhere. Um, I always ask you know this question. Anyone got a couple of bucks on them? People are like yeah yeah. I got a couple. Okay. So and the question is, are you going to then keep those? Like, is the money valuable? The answer yes, it is. Okay. So are you going to keep it then? Like you're just like gonna make sure that nothing ever happens to it, and you're gonna you know like treasure it until your dying day. People are like, well, no. <laughs> it's like, well, what do you plan to do with it? I plan to give it away for a taco or whatever, right? Uh, it's not like trade it, right? You know. So again, the money in and of itself doesn't do anything, right? It doesn't do anything if you just keep it, right? Now, of course, you know, saving is prudent because sometimes you'll need money later, yada yada, right? But 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 the just holding on to the money doesn't doesn't enrich you in any way. It doesn't doesn't provide anything valuable. The money is a medium of exchange only. So it's solely instrumentally good. It's an it's a it's a way of of getting other good things, right? So that's what makes it a, such a good example, you know. Most things are probably instrumentally good, like, you know, raindrops on roses, whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles, warm woolen mittens, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, those things are, you know, they're good perhaps because they bring pleasure or because, you know, they're, they, again, they're they're not good just in and of themselves, right? These are, you know, they're objects. They, they, they again, you know, bring pleasure or comfort or safety or, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, the, the, again, these are all instrumental goods. And just because something is instrumentally good doesn't mean it isn't good. Uh, but when we're talking about well-being, we tend to be talking about things that are really only intrinsically good. Things that are good in and of themselves. Um, and so the reason that instrumental goods are important to consider is because uh, one of the main reasons why things are instrumentally good is because they're good for the sake of something else. And very often they're good for the sake of um, pleasure. And uh, this is where the hedonist really sort of, you know, sort of shines uh, as, as, a, as a theory of well-being, uh, because what they can do is they can say, OK, well, you know, uh, why did you come to class today? And he's like, well, I want to get better grades. He would say, why do you want to get good grades? Well, because I want to get a really good job. And he's like, well, you know, what do you what do you want a job for? He's like, well, I want more money. What do you want the money for? Well, I want to you know, buy things I enjoy. And he's saying, you know, what, do you, what would you want to enjoy things for? Right. Uh, and that's the point at which all of a sudden the. Uh, the, the question starts stops making sense. He says, like, "What do you mean? What do I want to enjoy things for? Uh, have, you, have you tried enjoyment? Have you tried pleasure? Uh, it's you know, it seems to bottom out. You're like, why would you want pleasure? You're like, ah, because it's it's because it's enjoyable. I don't know. It's just a synonym, right? That doesn't uh, say anything. So, it, it seems like a lot of things bottom out in pleasure, but maybe not everything." OK, and so that's the that's the idea is that maybe there are things. So certainly I think I think most people agree that pleasure is good in and of itself. Um, but is it the only thing? All right. Is there more that goes on that list? And this is what list view theorists think. They think there's more than just pleasure goes on the list. 
Um, they think things like friendship, perhaps, is intrinsically good. It's good in and of itself. That is, even if it doesn't add pleasure, right? So imagine, you know, um, uh, uh, you, you know, the having, you know, sort of better friendships or whatever that doesn't necessarily, you know, mean more pleasure or something like that. And, and you know, the reason you want the friendship is not just for the pleasure. It might be good in and of itself, at least in some ways. Sure, friendships might bring about pleasure or other good things, but but they it might also just be good. It's plain and simple. Um, knowledge, certainly knowledge is sometimes instrumentally good, right? If you, um, you know, this, this is going to sound wild, but believe it or not, if you know enough about philosophical theories of well-being, somebody might actually pay you for that uh, someday. I know it's wild. Uh, but the idea is that even, so sometimes, again, knowledge can be instrumentally good, it being good for the sake of what else it can get you. But it might also be the case that even if nobody ever paid you for knowledge or you never got any benefit or pleasure out of having a particular piece of knowledge, isn't it better to have it than not to have it? And if the answer to that question is yes, well, you might be thinking of uh, knowledge as in some sense an intrinsic good, some it's good in and of itself. Uh, things like virtue, right? Again, even if you're not sort of richer or happier uh, being virtuous, just being virtuous is good enough, right? That's It's a good in and of itself, right? You know, uh, these are candidates, right? And there, there are potentially many more. Um, but these are the kinds of things uh, that you're looking for to say, um, uh, to, 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 to fill out uh, an objective list of, of what's, what's good for well-being. And so this brings us to the basic definition of an objective list theory. Um, and it's, it's the view that well-being consists of more than just pleasure or desire satisfaction. Um, and uh, there are lots and lots of different kinds of objective list views, right? There's, um, depending on how many things you put on the list, if it's lots, if it's a little, what things they put on there. Uh, and there are lots of, so this, this is a family of views, not just one singular view. And so if we're going to be talking about a, a list, we may as well use as an example uh, something like uh, the something like Brad Hooker's in the in the reading. Um, and uh, the list that uh, that Hooker gives us includes a, a pretty common set of objective goods. So uh, achievement is very often cited as uh, something that should go on the list. Uh, knowledge, um, you know, autonomy, appreciating beauty, friendship, those sorts of things. Um, in fact, uh, of course, not all of these things are created equal, right? So not all achievements are the same. Not all knowledge is the same. Um, you know, uh, the more significant the achievement, of course, the better. Uh, and the more it contributes to a, a life well lived, uh, the better, the more important the knowledge, right, that you have, the, the sort of more that contributes to one's well-being. Again, even if it doesn't create pleasure or nobody pays you for it or something like that. Um so that's the idea: is that is that is that a human life requires lots of different things. Uh, these things don't necessarily all reduce to just one thing. Um, they're they're different, uh, and uh, and they're all in some sense important uh, to to uh, you know to well-being. Uh, one of the most uh, famous kinds of objective list view has its own name. It's uh, it's called uh, perfectionism, and that uh, uh, comes out of uh, a lot of work by uh, Thomas Herka, who's a photograph there on the left, um, and uh, his view says that uh, what makes things uh, constituents of well-being is that they sort of perfect some element of human nature, right? And it, that's that doesn't tell you a lot about what the view really is, but it's hard to summarize, right? I think you just want to uh, you want to look up uh, some of Herka's writing, and and you know it, it's gonna it takes a little while to to explain the full view, um, but it's 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 a kind of objective list view. In fact, I, I the person photographed on the right there, uh, that's um, uh, David Brink, and he's the person that sort of coined the term objective list view. Uh, so that's uh, uh, kind of where we get the word. It's a we get a fairly modern uh, way of of uh, referring to a view that is actually fairly old. So uh, th one thing that is a challenge uh, for objective list theorists is deciding what goes on the list, <laughs> what to put on there, what to leave off of there. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, you know reasonable approaches to that. And I think one of the one very reasonable approach is one that is used in in, in our reading. And uh, it's uh, uh, Brad Hooker's approach of using this sort of this sort of thought experiment thing. And uh, forgive you have to forgive him a little bit for sort of beating this approach into the ground a little bit, and sort of you know using it very rigidly, sort of with one example after another. When one one probably would have done it, but um, but again, he's a philosopher, and philosophers uh, uh, very much you know like to to get 
to, to, to get things all out there, to get everything spelled out very clearly. Um, it's better to be clear and complete, uh, even at the expense of beating something to death a little bit, than it is to be unclear or incomplete. So um, so there we go. Here's, here's the basic uh, uh, scaffolding of that approach. Uh, so the idea is you, what you do is you imagine two lives, right? So like complete lives that are otherwise the same, except that one has more blank in it. And that, again, that blank could be pleasure, friendship, knowledge, achievement, whatever, right? And so you're supposed to then, you know, look at those two lives and ask a question. So do we really think, you know, when we're reflecting very carefully on this, is the one with the more blank in it better? Right? So like, it, it, you know, again, all things being, is, is the one with more blank in it a better life? Um, and... Uh, that's one question, okay? The second question necessary to ask also is does the life with more blank in it have to have more of something else valuable in order to have more blank in it, right? So for example, does a life with more pleasure in it have to have like say more achievement or something like that? Like that's the only way to get pleasure or uh, does it have to have more virtue in it? Uh, you know, if that's like the only way to, et cetera. So um, the idea is that if you can answer yes to the first question and no to the second, then it really seems you've identified something that probably contributes to well-being. If not, like, so th think of what happens if you answer no to the first question, right? So say you say, is okay, or, uh, imagine two lives, one of the lives um, has more ducks in it than the other, right? Well, is the life with more ducks in it better? Hard to say why, right? <laughs> you know, if so. And so I think you can, you can answer no to that question without too much trouble. And so that means maybe ducks are not intrinsic to, to, to human well-being, right? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. So again, that's, that's the idea with, with that first question. The second question, uh, is a little harder to, um, to really explain why it's in there, I guess. Uh, if you, if you really do get it, then great. Um, fast forward through this bit. Uh, but if not, you know, uh, think of it this way. Um, if let, let's, let's, let's put in something for the blank. Let's put in say knowledge. Okay. Um, or, or let's say achievement, let's say achievement. Uh, and so imagine two lives, uh, one of them has more achievement in it than the other. Is the one with more achievement in it better? It seems like we can say yes to that question, right? That, that seems fairly, fairly clear. So the second question, now imagine, might it be the case that, that achievements are always like pleasurable, right? Um, you know, so, so the idea is that the reason why the life with more achievement in it is better is because it's more enjoyable, right? People enjoy achieving things. And so if that's your thought process, then you look at question two and say, does the life with more achievement in it have to have more of something else valuable really in order to have sort of more, more achievement in it? Uh, or the idea is, is that is the reason that it's better that it has more pleasure in it and it's not really the achievement per se. Right. That's that's kind of the stuff that's going into question two, or maybe isn't is it just impossible right to achieve things without enough pleasure or without enough knowledge or something like that? That those are really what's explaining right. You know, uh, so another way to put it would be maybe the, the blank is not causing the well-being. The blank is caused by something else that is causing the well-being. Right. And that's what you want to try and try and winnow down. And that's that's hard. It's just difficult and it requires a lot of very careful thinking, a lot of very careful argument. And that's 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 what philosophers do. <laughs> and, and much ink has been uh, has been uh, used uh, toward that purpose. So. So that's the that's the idea. OK, um, is that uh, uh, you want to answer yes to the first question and then uh, no to the second. Right. Uh, but then, you know, you can as you might imagine, develop a fairly good-sized list uh, out of uh, something like this approach. So I'm going to briefly mention some objections to uh, objective list views, although this is sort of hard because, like I said, um, the the main way that objective that, that list theorists argue with each other and the main way that people argue with list theorists is by arguing uh, that they have, you know, it's like, okay, this thing that you're putting on the list doesn't really belong there. Notice that doesn't invalidate the whole idea of an objective list view. It just argues about an item on the list. So lots of the arguments concern what actually goes on the list and what doesn't go on the list and, and all that business. And those are real arguments, but they don't really say that the, the list theory itself is, is in any way a problem. So 
there are fewer of those kinds of arguments and, and, and it's a large family of views. One kind of, um, of objection is an objection to the whole, the whole set of, you know, of uh, list theorists and it's uh, an objection from elitism. And so the objection goes like this. And again, uh, Roger Crispin, the, uh, the uh, uh, SCP entry on, on well-being explains it so well. I've just quoted him here. Um, he says that one common objection to objective list theories is that they are elitist, right? Since they appear to be claiming that certain things are good for people, even if those people will not enjoy them and <laughs> do not want them. Okay, so... Notice what this is, is it's, it's, it's um, a, a kind of objection that devotees of other uh, uh, theories of well-being that we've already seen uh, would make. So um, uh, hedonists would say, well, you know, what good is it, are any of these things on your list if people don't necessarily enjoy them? So, for example, can you imagine um, making a great achievement that you didn't really enjoy, right? Um, I mean, maybe maybe you led a life of you know absolute you know selfless service to the world's poorest for your whole life, and it was it was it was a living hell, right? It was it was it was harsh, it was cold, it was uh, you know you were frequently sick, you were always hungry, you know you were always looking after somebody else, and it was it was a very very tough life that had very little pleasure in it, but you just thought it was so important to do, and so. Perhaps such a life would be a major achievement, right? I mean, people have been sainted for living lives of that kind. And I mean, that's, that's, it, it's hard to say it's a bad life, uh, given that there's this major achievement, but there might not have been any pleasure in it, right? And so that's the sort of thing that a hedonist would say, you know, that's not really a good life. Uh, you know, if the, you know, so, so if you, you know, having knowledge that doesn't necessarily bring you any enjoyment or having achievements that don't bring enjoyment, right? Like they think it's the enjoyment that really makes some of those things worthwhile when they are. Um, and, and the desire satisfaction theorist uh, talks about getting people getting what they, what they want, right? Having desire satisfied. And so, um, you know, what could is it if you can play the piano beautifully, if you didn't actually, you know, you really want to play the piano, right? Um, so, and, and again, both both uh, objections seem to have a point, right? I mean, it, it does seem a little funny to say that there can be elements that would be good for you, even if you neither take pleasure from them nor actually want them. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, uh, it might actually just be true. So this is, in fact, the reply, uh, and, and Chris uh, notes down the reply. He says, one strategy... Uh, to reply to this kind of uh, objection from elitism might be to adopt what he calls a hybrid account, according to which, peop uh, which certain goods do benefit people independently of pleasure and desire satisfaction, but only when they do in fact bring pleasure and or satisfy desires, right? Um, but then, of course, you'll notice some of the ways that we objected to desire satisfaction theorists um, in, in saying, well, wait a second, you know, if, if something, if, if, if a satisfied desire only contributes to well-being when you enjoy it, well, isn't it then the enjoyment that's important? Uh, so in this case, wouldn't it just be the pleasure that's important or the desire satisfaction that's important and not the independent, you know, thing on the list? Um, so that's, what, I, I don't think that's a promising reply, but it's it's available. Um, another approach uh, would be to simply bite the bullet and point out that, look, a theory could be both elitist and true. Um, <laughs> so it might be true that some things are actually good for you. They make your life go better, even if you don't enjoy it, the experience of it, right? And uh, even if you don't have like a desire for it, right? So, um, you know, again, having, you know, more sort of knowledge, achievement, you know, more sort of meaningful contribution to society, et cetera. So even if those aren't the things you wanted, having having done them, I think, makes your life better, right? The, certainly that's what a, an objective list uh, theorist could, could maintain. And so finally, uh, let's just a, a quick, you know, a, a summation of these objective list views. Um, there's not a whole lot more I can say about them. And the idea is that really the objective view is, at list view is at least as plausible as hedonism because hedonism is an objective list view. It's just that it has only one thing that is pleasure on the list, right? So there's a lot in common that these theories have and that where they differ is, is whether all intrinsic values really just reduce to one kind of pleasure or, or, or whether they don't. And that's, a, again, a very difficult question, but that's the heart of the difference between a list view and hedonism. Um, but both are, are sort of objective uh, theories as opposed to something like the desire satisfaction view. 
uh, the main difficulty, right, of the objective list view, the main thing that any list view has to deal with is trying to identify the good making features of each thing on the list. That is, why does it get to be on the list, right? And how do you tell what goes on the list um, and uh, what gets left off?